Skip, who many of you have known for quite some time, has been a gospel preacher for 20 some odd years. He uh, uh, served a stint of time in the Air Force and retired from there and, and uh, went into preaching. And he's been doing uh, mission work in England the past three years, been involved in the English lectures. Of course, he's preached in uh, various sundry locations. He's got his uh, wife here, Kay and, and Mary. Uh, they didn't, Mary didn't come see us. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've had high hopes for um, Skip, and I think there is hope for him. He is not a liberal, but he's a liberal light. You get that dubbed liberal light. <laughs> <laughs> I had to speak very slowly when I'm talking to Dub. <laughs> anyway, so we uh, uh, are very pleased to have Skip. And of course, he's staying at the house. Pleased to have uh, them, and and uh, always provides for a good conversation. And Nancy and I always provide for a good listen. He, to be able to speak, you got to have somebody who can listen. And we both perform that function very well. And at this time, I want him to speak on dispensationalism, and I want you to listen. And I know you'll do that. Skip. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, come to spring. I uh, want to thank the faithful elders here and the preacher here for continuing to have these very important lectures. You know, I was sitting there a little while ago and I was looking up at the sign and that really does say everything we need to say. We have to love truth and hate error. Uh, I've always kind of been marveled at the fact that so many in the Brotherhood today seem to think that you can contend for the faith without ever talking about or mentioning who your enemy is. Now, I was in the military for 21 years and I guarantee you, we needed to know a great deal about our enemy before we could contend for the faith. I've uh, appreciated my friendship and relationship with Brother Brown for several years. Uh, I want to express my special appreciation for Ken and Nancy for their hospitality, not only in putting up with me, but the often motley crew of preachers that they allow to stay in their home. I think they get a lot of credit for that. <laughs> Obviously, I am not Daniel Denham. I say obviously because Daniel is, of course, much older, and I'm taller and better looking. <laughs> but I will have to say that uh, it's very difficult to fill shoes like Daniel's when it comes to the scholarly work that he does. And today, we only hope that we can at least touch some of the mountaintops of the material that he presented in his manuscript. I did want to say one thing, too, about the, the, this uh, whole idea of false doctrine. You know, uh, I heard years ago that some subjects, trying to describe them, are like trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. You don't accomplish very much, and you usually make a mess of it. Well, you have an extra problem when you're dealing with false doctrine. Uh, I remember when I was quite a bit younger, back in the, when the dinosaurs still roamed the earth, and we had a hair care product for men, a little dabble do you, it was called Brill Cream, and it came in a tube, it looked just like the toothpaste tube. As a matter of fact, if you got up in the morning and you were a little bleary-eyed, you might reach for gleam and end up with Brill Cream. And all it took was a little bit of that on the brush and you realize pretty fast, that's not toothpaste. It doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. What matters is really what it is. And though many of these false doctrines present themselves like they are New Testament Christianity, they are false to the core. Because what's on the inside is not what's advertised on the outside. Uh, dispensationalism. I've been involved in summer camp the past couple of years. And there's been a lot of discussion about the possibility one day of having a permanent location for that. And in that vein, we had a talk 
couple of years ago about purchasing the, uh, the, the very place where we'd been having the camp. But upon my arrival last summer, I was informed that they were holding their options open because they thought they might get a better offer from their next door neighbor. Uh, well, their next door neighbor's name is Hal Lindsey. Uh, I know that he's no stranger to most brethren if they've uh, seen his books on the market. Uh, his books go back to when I first became a Christian back in 1972. And because of my own uh, uh, excitement of being a new Christian, I went down and frequented the Christian bookstores searching for things to read and I latched onto that book and boy, I read Late Great Planet Earth cover to cover. And then I asked my preacher what he thought about it. He said, well, Skip, he says, uh, let me borrow your book. And if you don't mind, I'm going to make some notes in it for you. And when I got that book back and I looked at what he would put in there and I took out my Bible and started to read the passages that he'd underlined and circled or added to, I realized pretty fast that Hal Lindsey is a false teacher. The... Hal Lindsey received his uh, theological training at Dallas Theological Seminary. And while he was there, a fellow student was another man by the name of John Walbird. And John Walbird also has written some books on dispensationalism. The school that they attend was founded by Lewis Sperry Chafer, and Lewis Sperry Chafer was a student of C.I. Schofield. Now, in modern times, I guess the only one I can really identify with right away is Hal Lindsey because he was the one that was around when I first became a Christian. And I began to realize that his sycophants are doing even a better job of publishing books and selling the idea of dispensational premillennialism, but it didn't originate with Lindsey by any stretch of imagination. Uh, this doctrine has been around since John Nelson Darby back in the 19th century. And it's spread like wildfire ever since. In fact, I've concluded that the various forms of premillennialism are jointly one of the most dangerous doctrines of modern times. You know, we have many, many denominational churches out there today that if you were to talk to most of the members, don't really even have a clue what their denomination teaches. Because they're not really taught denominational doctrine anymore. There's not a margin difference between what you would find in a Methodist building, a Presbyterian building, or a Baptist building. But boy, they can sure tell you about the rapture. I find that interesting because the rapture is never mentioned by name or concept in the Bible. I have, uh, like so many, tried to understand why people want to believe in this doctrine. And I guess it was my love for science fiction that really brought the answer to me because after the umpteenth time I watched Captain Kirk say, beam me up, Scotty, I began to get a picture in my mind. Well, what it is is we spend so much time trying to tell people about Jesus Christ and having them fail to listen to us and getting frustrated because they're not listening to us, that we start to reach a stage where mentally we want some kind of real in-your-face situation to occur that the rest of the world would know they've been wrong all along and we were right. And being left behind is exactly that kind of thing. And of course, I mentioned left behind because the current crop of books is not the late great planet Earth or Satan is alive and well on Earth, but Tim LaHaye and his Left Behind books, which uh, is probably one of the biggest sellers of Christian fiction ever. There are currently 16 books in this series, along with graphic novels, CDs, movies, and DVDs. They're often used in Bible classes and Sunday schools as teaching material. And again, you often hear denominational people talk about the rapture. Now, when you look at what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, you might conclude, if you didn't know any better, that that's talking about what premillennialists refer to as the rapture. But of course, there are some big problems with it. 
Let's start with the fact that no one will be left behind. All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. John 5, 29. And you know, if, if ever there's a passage that should settle that whole hash right now, that's it. All means all. It doesn't mean some now, some later. And that's where you really get into a, a confusion over this whole idea. I guess what seems to get lost on most people. Did I mention before that Left Behind was Christian fiction? That's where they find it in the bookstore. But they take it home and read it like it's truth like it's prophecy and like somehow Tim LaHaye just tapped into the mind of God and and now can tell us everything that's going to happen with his bizarre ideas about eschatology as Daniel quoted in the book and I and I would have used this material as well because I remember that quote brother Foy Wallace's definition of premillennialism pre means before Millennial means a thousand years, and ism means there ain't no such thing. Now, I could say the same thing about dispensationalism as a branch of premillennialism. Dispensation refers to a period of time or a, a law era. Dispensational refers to the concept that, that is being expressed in this lesson, the, the doctrine of there being various different eras of time throughout time in which the Lord has, has sanctioned certain things. But especially including one more era after the one we live in. And that's, I think, the key to this whole thing. But you also get to the ism part, and when it comes to dispensational, there ain't no such thing. I was uh, very blessed when I first began to preach um, you know, uh, John, I'm sorry, I didn't get to go to Memphis or East Tennessee or any of those schools that were out there, uh, Florida. Uh, I kind of became a preacher almost accidentally, preaching in a small congregation in Idaho because no one else would do the job, and over time it just became a job. Uh, I was, I was kind of interested, I was uh, going to mention, but, but he didn't bring it up. Uh, usually when I get introduced, some mention will be made of my education. Uh, I've got a bachelor's degree in management and a bachelor's degree in computer information systems, and I'm just up here wasting my education, as some might say. But as I began to, uh, to preach up there, I was blessed with really some really good tutors that helped me to learn what it meant to be a preacher. And one of those men was a brother by the name of Roger Barron that some of you know, and I know Brother Dub knows in particular, but some of the rest of you know who he is as well. Brother Roger Barron publicly advertised the fact that he had a $5,000 cashier's check in a safety deposit box that was set aside for anyone that could prove from the Bible that Jesus Christ was ever going to set foot on the earth again. That was a pretty safe bet. Because you can search your Bible cover to cover, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, and not find one mention that that's ever going to happen. But that is the heart of dispensationalism and premillennialism. The question that I was asked to answer was, what is dispensationalism? Well, I mentioned part of the problem of trying to describe anything that is difficult to describe. Sometimes you make a mess of it. But there's also another problem. It's hard to define a doctrine that men that believe in it don't agree on. And Lindsay and LaHaye and Walverd and Jerry Falwell and all those dispensational people have different takes and different spins on how this system takes place. So how am I supposed to really represent what they're teaching? Well, we're still going to try. 
But you know what it comes down to, brethren, and this comes down to that with every single lesson that's being taught here this week. If it's not in the Bible, it doesn't matter. And that really is the heart of the problem. Again, I mentioned dispensationalism as a form of premillennialism. But it differs in certain fundamental ways with the ones that we often call either historic or cultic premillennialism. And I'm not going to delve deeply into cultic premillennialism simply because it's not the major issue that we're dealing with out in the world today. It involves certain smaller groups of people like the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Armstrongites, and some of those folks. But we'll deal more with historic premillennialism, which is the more uh, common version. Now, I'll mention that all three share certain ideas. All three believe in a thousand years of Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 7 as being literal. They all three believe the second coming of Christ will occur just prior to the beginning of that thousand years. They all three believe that the time of this coming, Christ will begin to reign over his physical earthly kingdom on earth. And of course, that the kingdom of Christ is a material kingdom, like that of King David and ancient Israel. And it will also include all of the restoration of the Judaic institutions. Now that might explain, at least in part, why so many of our politicians favor Israel so strongly. I've had concerns over that over the years, because Israel doesn't always do everything right either in that mess that they're in over there. And they've gotten our own government into trouble more often than not. But if you start to look at most of the fellows that are running for office, what religious background they have is predominantly premillennial. And of course, uh, Mr. Romney, uh, is, uh, with, with his Mormon background, definitely would be premillennial. They believe that Israel's the key. And if they can do something to help to restore them in full, they're going to try to do that. The first thing I wanted to talk about to try to understand dispensationalism is the church. How, does, how do they look at the church? Well, the basic differences between historic and dispensational premillennialism lie in certain basic concepts. First, that the church is some kind of a parenthesis in the forming of the kingdom of God. Now, I use that term parenthesis because that's their word. That's not the word that I've used to describe what they suggest takes place. According to this concept, Jesus came here 2,000 years ago with the intent of becoming king over Israel in the literal, physical sense of that mean, the meaning of that word. But that he was rejected. In other words, he failed. God made a mistake. Now, the question in my mind is, why does anybody want to believe in a God who errs? And if God can make one error, how about God making a whole bunch of other errors? Which is what ultimately that implies. I had this same problem with the Mormon doctrine that teaches that God had a wife and her name was Mary. Because the end result of that relationship, of him having a physical relationship with Mary, which is what they teach, I know that didn't get covered in the lesson this morning, but, but that's part of what they teach, is that either God's committing adultery or Mary is. And who can accept that? Is it true that in any sense, the church was some kind of an afterthought that bore no support in either testament. Well, you know, the church was founded, I think we can all agree, the church was founded on the basis of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Even the parentheses people believe that. But was the rejection of Christ foretold in the Old Testament prophecies, since that's what brought about his death, burial, and resurrection? 
Well, we don't have to go far because all of us probably by now are familiar with the writings of Isaiah, and especially Isaiah 53. Hundreds of years before Christ was born, Isaiah referred to Christ as despised and rejected in verse 3 of chapter 53. In verse 5, he describes him as wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And no other man but Christ ever fulfilled those blood requirements. If we go further, we get down to verse 9, we see other details of his death. That he made his grave with the wicked. Well, we now know that that's a reference to him being crucified between two thieves. But further, that he was with the rich at his death. So his burial was in a wealthy man's tomb. So what we see is that the rejection of Christ was clearly expressed in the Old Testament. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't some band-aid or patch or parentheses to get us into some future kingdom situation. But in addition, the church itself is mentioned in prophecy in, prophecy in both testaments. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Now, up to those last few words, we might have, that could have been almost anything. The religion of Judaism is clearly not in consideration because it points to including all nations, not just Judaism. Further, the time when this would begin is delineated in the next verse. It says in that verse, in verse 3, many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now the event that's a reference to was what happened on Pentecost. When the church was clearly in existence, because all of that story about Pentecost we read in Acts chapter 2 and the last verse says the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Even in this chapter, in Acts chapter 2, we have the church being prophesied from because of the reference made to the prophet Joel in verse 16. And such events could not have been fulfilled if the church was not a part of God's plan. But there is also biblical proof in the New Testament that God intended the existence of the church not later on, but from before the foundation of the world. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul writes, beginning in verse 9, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. The rejection of Christ, the involvement of the church, was part of God's eternal purpose. I've done many lessons over the years, many sermons. I think I did a sermon on this just a couple of weeks ago where I talked about this very same thing. Do we ever marvel at the love of God that went ahead and created man knowing before he made man that man was going to sin and that he was going to have to send his son to die for mankind? My poor thought processes just have a hard time grasping that kind of love. But that's exactly what the Bible tells us. The rejection of Christ is mentioned in the New Testament as part of God's eternal plan and purpose. In 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 19, Peter writes, But with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. 
Jesus being foreordained before the foundation of the world was likewise foreordained to be the Lamb of God, a slain sacrifice for the sins of man. This wasn't a mistake. It wasn't an error. It wasn't a band-aid. It wasn't a patch on the part of God. It was always God's plan that all things should happen exactly as they did happen. Now, secondly, dispensationalism teaches that there are, in effect, two different Gospels. As Daniel pointed out in his manuscript, some dispensationalists believe in four, but the predominant idea is two. One for the Jews and a different one for the Gentiles. Now that's become so widespread in belief that I first heard this from a professed gospel preacher in the church 15 years ago. It is yet another idea that came from the mind of man and not the mind of God. In this notion, however, lies the seed of a most insidious idea concerning the Lord, as well as the key to why so many put their hope and trust in physical Israel. The two gospel notions suggest that there are two, two different paths that lead to the same place, a Jewish path and a Christian path. And from this idea, mankind has spawned the notion of a Judeo-Christian. People often refer to our country as a Judeo-Christian country. There is no Judeo-Christian. It doesn't exist. Nor is there a hyphenated Christian of any kind, i.e. Methodist Christian, Presbyterian Christian, Lutheran Christian, matters not what you call it. There's yet only one path to gain the heavenly abode, and that's the one gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what prompted them to say in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now Peter, James, and John knew that very well, because they'd been on the Mount of Transfiguration. They'd saw Jesus standing there with both Moses and Elijah, Elijah, representative of all the prophets, Moses as the great lawgiver, and heard the voice of God say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That settles the matter. The idea of there being salvation in no other name would also include, but not be limited to, men like Joseph Smith, Charles Taze Russell, the Armstrongs, Oral Roberts, Hal Lindsey, the Pope, or anyone else that seeks to add to or detract from the word of the Lord. Now, there are many names that we find in dispensationalism that are names that a lot of us are familiar with. We see the names of Ryrie and Moody, Schofield and Dixon, and there are, of course, others, probably one of the more well-known modernists more because of his political ramifications than his, uh, his uh, theology, was Jerry Falwell. If God had intended us to understand that there were two different Gospels, one would think that, well, it would be clearly expressed in God's Word. Yet the opposite stands true. From the prayer of Jesus on his betrayal night to Paul's expression of unity to the Ephesians, we learn about the oneness of the body of Christ. John 17, verse 20 and 21, in that prayer, he said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, as I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Or Romans 1.16, which says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He didn't say there was two gospels. He said it was to the Jew first and then the Greek. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Or 1 Corinthians 1, 12 and 13. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I of Cephas, or I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
or that wonderful section on unity given to us in Ephesians 4, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Clearly, the unity of the gospel is expressed on every page of the gospel. Now, one thing we do want to make clear so that we don't have any misunderstanding, the Bible does teach the idea of dispensations. And I'm certain that everyone here knows that. But it does not teach the doctrine currently touted as dispensationalism. First of all, the dispensationalists teach dispensations that go well beyond the Christian era. And in that, we do part company. Schofield taught seven different dispensations, five of which precede the church, and one comes after the church. And that last is not the new heavens and the new earth, but an earthly kingdom reigned by King Jesus. Though the Bible does teach different dispensations or law periods, there are but three. And none exists beyond the Christian age that we live in today. The period known as patriarchy begins with Adam and ends with Moses and covers the entire book of Genesis. The patriarchal age ends when God gives the law to Moses and begins the Mosaic or law period, which ends with Christ when he is risen from the dead and ushers in the Christian or church age. We are under law, Daniel points that out well in the manuscript, it's the law of Jesus Christ. James 1.25, we all, I'm certain, know, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. But also Galatians 6.2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If there wasn't the law in the New Testament, it wouldn't be mentioned, but there is. And, of course, the Christian age is described in many ways as the last age. We go back to that sermon on Pentecost. And Peter begins in Acts 2, verse 16, and says, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. <coughs> and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven, above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For Peter to say this is what or this is that as he does in the first verse there is to pinpoint to a specific time frame the last days. And of course the quotation of Joel tells that these events occur in the last days. God pinpointed this dispensation as the last days through the words he gave to the writer of Hebrews. As the letter itself begins with the statement, God who at various times and in various ways has spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2. Now, one of the big problems that I mentioned earlier with premillennialism and the whole concept, whether it's dispensation or some other version, is that it stands and falls on one passage of Scripture. Revelation 20, beginning in verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, 
who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now when a thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. Now the premillennial dispensationalists will try to take these verses out of every kind of context and make them teach what they want people to believe. Such has been the tactic of every false teacher since Satan tempted Mother Eve in the garden. The dispensationalists will try to take parts of the passages, say they're literal while other parts are not. In fact, which words are literal and which are figurative are up to the personal prejudices of the interpreter. Rather than use the recognized standards of interpretation, such as context and sentence structure and syntax, the dispensationalist has determined which words are literal and which are figurative based on his own bias and his own desired theological outcome. In the passage that we just read, the thousand years and the thrones are interpreted as literal, but the rest is all given some figurative spiritual spin. In fact, the key to this alleged millennium is in the very binding of Satan, which they believe happens at the beginning of the thousand years at some point in the future, which they keep trying to predict but never accomplish. When Jesus was asked to explain his own ability to cast out demons in Matthew 12, his explanation was, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and despoil his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? Matthew 12, verse 28 and 29. Jesus himself set the time of the beginning of his kingdom saying, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you, and then connected it with his own binding of Satan. Now that shows that the kingdom of God, which we know is the church, is already with us, and not the product of some false idea of eschatology. As to Christ's reign being limited to a thousand years, nothing in the passage says anything about the length of Jesus' reign. I guess that's part of the thing I've always wondered about, how people can read that into it. What it says is that the souls beheaded for their witness of Christ lived and reigned with him a thousand years. But the time factor isn't attached to Christ, it's attached to them. If I told you that I lived with my mom and dad for 18 years, would you conclude that my mom and dad only lived 18 years? You sure wouldn't. And the Revelation saying the same thing, the same idea. It doesn't tell you how long the reign of Christ is. It only has bearing on the souls mentioned and not on Christ at all. Besides the fact that throughout the scriptures, the term a thousand is used as some long yet indefinite period of time. Or might also be a long and indefinite measure of something. We don't always know what. We live in the millennium. We've done so since the first Pentecost after the death of Christ. It's not some mystical time to come. It's here and has been here since Peter described the Lord as sitting on the right hand of God. Of this, there should be no doubt. Now, that said, the so-called sugar stick of premillennialist stripe has been removed. If the kingdom is not already here, then Jesus lied. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's near, not some faraway time in the future. Even more so, what he said in Mark 9.1. He said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. So we might ask ourselves, when did power come down that demonstrated the existence of the kingdom? 
Well, we go back to Pentecost again, don't we? I've always marveled at that word power. In Greek, it's dunamis. And it's where we get the word dynamite. And it's not used a lot in Scripture. But one of the few places it is used is in Mark 9, 1 and in Acts 1, verse 8, where it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now that not only teaches them and taught them that the Holy Spirit was going to come and bring that power, so they knew when it was going to happen. They knew where it was going to happen because they were told to stay in Jerusalem. But it also predicted how the gospel would spread. And when we begin to read the pages of the gospel, we find out it had spread exactly that way. Began in Jerusalem. Then it spread throughout Judea. In Acts chapter 8, it was brought to Samaria. And then it was fulfilled by being preached to the Gentiles in Acts chapters 10 and 11 in Cornelius' house. In Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The existence of the kingdom was heralded with power, and that power came on the day of Pentecost. There can be no doubt that the kingdom that Jesus spoke of did come, while some of those to whom he had been speaking were still alive. And it came when power came down, as demonstrated miraculously by the Holy Ghost. The church has been in existence since Pentecost, and the church is the kingdom of God of which God spoke through men of God as they were divinely inspired to the Holy Spirit. Dispensationalism. Dispensation referring to a period of time, dispensation all referring to a system or doctrine and ism, there ain't no such thing. Thank you, brethren. You know, I find it amazing that the... uh these premillennial dispensationalists will assert that uh, the church was substituted for the kingdom because when Christ came fully expecting to establish the kingdom, uh, he was disappointed, rejected, and killed as a result of it. So he's going to come back and establish the same thing that the Jews killed him for not establishing the first time, which is a uh, sort of ludicrous to think so in this thousand years I've spoken of in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20. I, I know that in the first chapter, John speaks of these things that must come to pass shortly. And Jesus in the uh, last chapter is talking about coming quickly. quickly. Well, I don't know. I, I guess one can make the argument that, uh, you know, a thousand years in terms of eternity is a very short time. But it had to be uh, in the expectation of the readers at that time something that was going to happen very quickly. So it could not have been, could not have been the idea that uh, uh, you know, Jesus was disappointed that he couldn't establish his kingdom. And we read in the 15th chapter of 1 uh, uh, Corinthians that uh, the kingdom is spoken of there. And uh, it's spoken of as Jesus reigning over that kingdom then, which is now, he's reigning over the kingdom now, and it tells when that kingdom will end. It's going to end when it's delivered up to uh, God, and when the last uh, enemy is defeated, death, that's when it's going to end. It's not going to be reestablished. It's already here to satisfy the... uh, uh, doctrine of the dispensationalist, what would have to happen is that the temple would have to be reconstituted in Jerusalem. The Jews would have to be gathered again in, in Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus would have to be set up on a throne in Jerusalem and as David had established the throne. And then we'd have to reign for a thousand years. 
I've never seen one of these dispensationalists uh, would be willing to be beheaded so they might be one of the ones to reign with him. So you're right, uh, Skip, they take that chapter 20 and pick certain parts of it as literal and the rest of it they take as figurative. And to know which is which, you have to ask them. <laughs> so we appreciate that and uh, certainly uh, in fact, I remember uh, you mentioned Foy Wallace. He uh, had quite a bit to say about that. and I can't remember. There's some fellow, uh, Bo, that R.H. Bo. B-O-L-L. B-O-L-L, yeah. Bo Weevil. Bo, <laughs> Bo Weevil. <laughs> I understand he was a weevil. <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, that concludes this, uh, this uh, session. And it, uh, Skip, it's very fine, very fine.